This video is brought to you by Devout Decals, makers of reusable Catholic art for your home altar, your bedroom, and your home classroom. What I have for you today is a classic vision of St. John Bosco. Here he is describing essentially a portion of the restoration of the church and sort of a supernatural take on what the restoration of the Catholic Church will be from the grips of worldliness and modernism that we see in our time now. But what he's describing also is the angelic pontiff, and his vision isn't that long. So I thought this was a good opportunity also to provide a someone else's, a lesser known figure's vision of the angelic pontiff as well. The angelic pontiff is this idea that gets maligned for those who follow Catholic prophecy to any degree. There are some who think the idea was fabricated in the Middle Ages or something to, you know, as a sort of, uh, you know, extremely very French thing to sort of show how the French would rule everything or something. It's a strange idea, the great Catholic monarch and the angelic pontiff. So what I have here is first St. John Bosco and then the vision of a very lesser known person, Abbot Joaquin Merlin, who died in the year 1541, and he made the, the prediction of a great pontiff. So let's start with St. John Bosco and his vision of the 200. It was a dark night, and men could no longer find their way back to their own countries. Suddenly a most brilliant light, faith in God and in his power, shone in the sky, illuminating their way as at high noon. At that moment, from the Vatican came forth, as in procession, a multitude of men and women, young children, monks, nuns, and priests, and at their head was the Pope. But a furious storm broke out, somewhat dimming that light, as if light and darkness were locked in battle. Meanwhile, the long procession reached a small square littered with dead and wounded, many of whom cried for help. The ranks of the procession thinned considerably. After a 200-day march, all realized that they were no longer in Rome. In dismay, they swarmed about the pontiff to protect him and minister to him in his needs. At that moment, two angels appeared, bearing a banner which they presented to the supreme pontiff, saying, Take the banner of her who battles and routs the most powerful armies on earth. Your enemies have vanished. With tears and sighs, your children plead for your return. On one side of the banner bore the inscription, Regine sine labe concepta, queen conceived without sin. And the other side read, Auxilium Christianorum, help of Christians. The pontiff accepted the banner gladly, but he became distressed to see how few were his followers. But the two angels went on, Go now, comfort your children. Write to your brothers scattered throughout the world that men must reform their lives. This cannot be achieved unless the bread of the divine word is broken among the peoples teach children their catechism, and preach detachment from earthly things. The time has come, the two angels concluded, when the poor will evangelize the world. Priests shall be sought among those who wield the hoe, the spade, and the hammer, as David prophesied. God lifted the poor man from the fields to place him on the throne of his people. On hearing this, pontiff moved on, and the ranks began to swell. Upon reaching the holy city, the pontiff wept at the sight of his desolate citizens, for many of them were no longer. He then entered St. Peter's and intoned the Te Deum, to which a chorus of angels responded, singing, Gloria in excelsis Deo, et in terra pax hominibus bone voluntatis. Glory to God in the highest, and peace on earth to men of good will. When the song was over, all darkness vanished and a blazing sun shone forth. The population had declined greatly in the cities and in the countryside. The land was mangled as if by a hurricane and hailstorm, and people sought each other, deeply moved, and saying, Es Deus in Israel, there is a God in Israel. From the start of the exile until the intoning of the Te Deum, the sun rose two hundred times. All the events described covered a period of four hundred days. That sounds like a lot of different things, doesn't it? like a softer version of the Three Days of Darkness, perhaps, or at least of the general ch great chastisement that seems to be a running theme in Catholic prophecy and Marian messages. And so now I will present to you 
as sort of more insight into this, I think, the the fairly well known, if you've read any of the more obscure Catholic prophecies, vision of Abbot Joachim Merlin, who died in 1541. He was a monk. And here he tells us of his prediction or his vision of a great pope. After many prolonged sufferings endured by Christians, and after a too great effusion of innocent blood, the Lord shall give peace and happiness to the desolated nations. A remarkable pope will be seated on the pontifical throne under the special protection of the angels. Holy and full of gentleness, he shall undo all wrong. He shall cover the states of the church and reunite the ex exiled temporal powers. He shall be revered by all people and shall cover the kingdom of Jerusalem. As the only pastor, he shall reunite the East to the Western Church, and thus only one faith will be in vigor. The sanctity of this beneficent pontiff will be so great that the highest potentates shall bow before his presence. This holy man shall crush the arrogance of religious schism and heresy. All men will return to the primitive church, and there shall be only one pastor, one law, and one teacher, humble, modest, and fearing God. The tr true God of our elder brothers, our Lord Jesus Christ, will make everything prosper beyond all human hope, because God alone can and will pour down on the wounds of humanity the oily balm of sweetness. The heavens proclaim the glory of God, and the faithful are in joy and happiness, because the Lord has vouchsafed to be merciful to them. He shall invite his chosen to the banquet of the Lamb, where melodious canticles and harmonious concerts will be heard. The power of this pontiff's holiness will be so great as to be able to check the fury and impetuosity of threatening waves. Mountains shall be lowered before him, and the sea shall be dried up. The dead shall be raised, the churches shall be reopened, and altars erected. It should be known that there will be two heads, one in the east and the other in the west. This pope shall break the weapons and scatter the fighting hordes. He will be the joy of God's chosen. This angelic pope will preach the gospel in every country. Through his zeal and solicitude, the Greek church shall be forever reunited to the Catholic church. Before, however, being firmly and solidly established in the Holy See, there will be innumerable wars and violent conflicts during which the sacred throne shall be shaken. But through the favor of divine clemency, moved by the prayers of the faithful, everything will succeed so well that they shall be able to sing hymns of thanksgiving to the glory of the Lord. This holy pope shall be both pastor and reformer. Through him the east and west shall be an everlasting concord. The city of Babylon shall then be the head and guide of the world. Rome, weakened in temporal power, shall forever preserve her spiritual dominion, and shall enjoy great peace. During these days the angelic pope shall be able to address to heaven prayers full of sweetness. The dispersed nation shall also enjoy tranquility. Six and a half years after this time the pope will render his soul to God. The end of his day shall arrive in an arid province, situated between a river and a lake near the mountains. At the beginning in order, these happy results, having need of a powerful temporal assistance, this holy pontiff will ask the cooperation of the generous monarch of France. At that time a handsome monarch, a scion of King Pepin, will come as a pilgrim to witness the splendor of this glorious pontiff, whose name shall begin with R a temporal throne being vacant. The Pope shall place on it this king whose assistance he shall ask. When a monster shall appear in the sky, thou shalt find a ready escape towards the east, and after nine years thou shalt render thy soul to God. A man of remarkable sanctity will be his successor in the pontifical chair. Through him God will work so many prodigies that all men shall revere him, and no person will dare to oppose his holy precepts. He shall not allow the clergy to have many benefices. He will induce them to live by tithes and offerings to the faithful. He shall interdict pomp and dress and all immorality in dance and song. He will preach the gospel in person and exhort all honest ladies to appear in public without any ornament of gold or precious stones. After having occupied the Holy See for a long time, he shall happily return to the Lord. His three immediate successors shall be men of exemplary holiness. One after the other will be models of virtue and shall work miracles, confirming the teachings of their predecessors. Under their leadership the church shall spread, and these popes shall be called the angelic pastors. And that sounds like a true restoration of the church to me. I want to 
very curious what you think about this, so let me know what you think in the comments, please. As always, of course, remember with Catholic prophecy and visions, whether approved or not, you should always put them as secondary at best to the magisterial teachings of the church, the deposit of faith as seen in sacred scripture, our sacred tradition, and everything else. That doesn't mean these should be completely discounted either. Let me know what you think of this in the comments. Please like and subscribe if you haven't. It really does help. Have a blessed Sunday today, and as always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.